thank you maharaj for joining today for sparing your time so today i was planning we could discuss on the topic of writing in bhakti yoga writing for krishna and um, broadly in uh, i have been in my personal spiritual journey you have been the biggest inspiration for me for writing and i and i in 2000 i think 2002 or 3 you had come to pune when i was there and i had published some articles in times of india and you saw those article i showed them to you you are so happy and then i asked how i could improve the articles so how i could improve my writing skills and you gave me a list of books that i could read but at that time amazon and all this was not so active so i i was wondering how would get the books and then you came to america and through govind prabhu and through bhima prabhu and to several other devotees you actually bought several books and sent them to me i was uh, amazed by your uh, your concern and your eagerness that uh, uh, that i learned to write and that has been a uh, enduring inspiration for me and i remember in one of your writing seminars you mentioned that prabhu pa told you that learn learn editing and teach it to others hmm. so so you you seen that writing is a important service in our tradition for us to continue so i would like to discuss today about actually it's like continue your prescribed duty and train others that's what he said continue prescribed duty okay so uh, okay this one raj so so in uh, i when i travel across especially in india now there are a lot of young devotees who are joining or college graduates and quite well educated and they like to they want to write the blogosphere has actually opened a whole new universe for writing for devotees so i wanted to discuss about how devotees could do that and broadly there are three aspects to writing one is the inspiration to write then there is the, the skills to write and then there is the for, uh, forums where devotees can write so i thought we could discuss these three things so if somebody wants to write maharaj what, what should be the inspiration why one should write because there are so many other services that can be also be done main inspiration is that that we've heard um shravanam kirtanam prabhat said because i was in, he told how he was how he his spiritual master remarked this boy likes to hear and prabhat said because i was enthusiastic about hearing shravanam now i'm enthusiastic about kirtanam uh, okay chanting or or preaching so that's the first thing the enthusiasm is not artificial it comes from following the regular principles chanting hari krishna uh, reading the books uh, serving then by these things we get uh, natural enthusiasm for all of of our activities otherwise it it won't be there it won't be uh, genuine enthusiasm won't won't arise but if we follow then these things will come mm. then by hearing we become enthusiastic that this the subject matter is so nice i want to uh, share this i want to distribute this this understanding uh that's that should be the main and i want to serve my spiritual master wants this message distributed so i should uh try to please him i should try to serve him uh that's the main thing it's not for name and fame it's not for other things but to please krishna please the spiritual master and benefit others mm. yes maharaj in general there is some reservation on, as when it comes to writing when kirtanam many devotees are encouraged to speak and share about krishna but quite often when it comes to writing many people feel that writing almost become it becomes like there are already prabhupad's books why do you want to write more and speaking is encouraged but to write lectures we can play prabhupad's lectures we don't need anyone else to speak by that argument mm -hmm. we can play prop don't you don't even need kirtan we'll just play recordings of prabhupad that's not a good argument okay 
So the tradition is as a living tradition, it has to continue. And Prabhupada wanted it. He said, all of my, my students, I want all of my students to write. He said, what is this back to Godhead for? That's one of the purposes, so that the, the devotees will, will write. Mm. And he said, write your realization. He said, it doesn't matter, two lines, four lines. Uh, every day write something. Okay. Which is also standard writing advice from the writing gurus, uh, the mundane writing gurus that you, you write. Yeah. Writers write. So do you feel in some ways writing has been underemphasized as compared to say, many other services? This is a very direct instruction. Every day write something. But uh, uh, there's so many. I, there's no point for me to comment on what's overemphasized, what's em underemphasized. Okay. That's a management okay. matter. But okay. but Prabhupada wanted us to write. That's all. Yes, Maharaj. And uh, generally, when uh, <clears throat> if devotees do some services, me, I, sorry to interrupt, but uh, look at what he did. <laughs> Prabhupada said, do as I do. So Prabhupada wrote. He did everything. He, he chanted, he, he cooked, he, and he wrote books. Yeah. And he encouraged his followers to write books. Satsurup Maharaj, he uh, published that book, Readings in Vedic mm -hmm. Literature. Prabhupada encouraged that. Srup Damodar uh, Maharaj, Krishna, the Supreme Scientist, Prabhupada encouraged that. And so he wanted it to go on. Maharaj, how did you start your writing or journey or your literary service? Was that your, something interested in your pre-devotional days also? No, like, not so much. Oh. So how, how did you begin this service? Uh, well, Prabhupada said, right. I started writing articles for Back to Godhead. Oh. That is from that the was... 1970s itself, or? Uh, yeah. Okay. Early 1970s. And generally, in the secular world, when people form some, uh, people want to write, often they form some kind of writer's guild, where that there is a like-minded association and people can, can read each other's writings and that encourages everyone. So are there, any, uh, are there any ways like that that devotees can get encouragement for writing that you know within the devotee world? I don't really know of any. Okay. And uh, so when devotees start writing, the one, now presently, a lot of our ISKCON is based in India. And in some ways, Indian, many of the Indians who are coming to our movement are also from, more from an engineering background, more from a STEM background. So how important is it to, to actually learn the skills of writing and spend a significant amount of time in that? Because as compared to other services, writing often seems to be like a, time intensive service. And that often makes devotees apprehensive about the level of commitment required. Everything's time intensive. Deity worship is time intensive. Kirtan is time intensive. Chapa is time intensive. Everything's time intensive. But as far as you know, learning writing skills and so on, not everyone will do that. Some will be more enthusiastic for puja. Some will be more enthusiastic for book distribution. Some will be more enthusiastic for management. Some will be more enthusiastic for writing. So the, the pujari people will attend the pujari courses. The management people will attend the management courses uh, mm. according to one's interest and enthusiasm. So when uh, Prabhupada said that every day write something, was he, could he also have been mentioning more about a personal journal if every day, if that's a standard instruction for all devotees, was he talking about for outreach or for, for more for? It might be, outreach, but he said that writing helps when you write, then you have to think about the subject matter. So it helps clarify your thoughts. So for that reason also, it might be published or not published, but it, okay. it helps your um, realization, your understanding. 
Yes, Maharaj. And uh, so you, you're saying that those who do, not all devotees might become writers who actually do writing as a major service, but those who do, then they, sh they should get some training as a... Well, it's up to them. They may just write with, without any formal training or, or anything, just write their realizations and uh, maybe depend on editors to polish it up. Mm. But um, if one is serious about writing, then there's much to be said for uh, learning the ins and outs of it, learning the craft. Yes, Maharaj. So you have conducted editing courses also. Are there any particular uh, ways that a uh, particular resources that you would recommend for uh, writing? For if devotees want to learn? Yeah, there's there, there are books. I think you have the list. Strunk and White is high on the list. Yes. Um, William Zinser's On Writing Wells. Writing well, yeah. Um, there's um, the uh, the writer's art by I think James J. Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick, yeah, I said I read um, that. The practical stylist by Sheridan Baker is useful. Um, okay. Undergraduate text, um, and there are more, of course. Some of them tell more about the uh, technical side of writing. Some uh, focus on different areas. Those are some of the books I've found useful. Yes, Maharaj. And uh, so when, how, how useful do you feel are online writing tools like say Grammarly or something like that, which do proofread? Grammarly, I, I haven't used Grammarly. I get the idea of it. Um, it may be useful for letter writers and report writers and, and things like that. They're not really a substitute for understanding the basic rules of grammar. Um, and a lot of people, you know, they're businessmen and so on, they don't have to learn the basic rules of grammar. Um, they can use Grammarly and, and uh, you know, clean up their act that way. But for those who are serious about writing, depending on Grammarly is probably a bad idea. Oh, okay. It, it will become like a crutch which will prevent one's own development? In that yeah, case? you don't really know what the rules are. You don't know why Grammarly is telling you what it's telling you. Um, I assume you don't know. I don't know how much information it gives you. But um, yeah, it becomes a crutch. You should learn. Um, you should learn at least some of what the people who programmed Grammarly know and not depend on Grammarly to, to know it for you. Um, especially since there's a lot of things that Grammarly can't doesn't know and can't teach yeah. you. And if you haven't mastered the basics, you're not going to go on to those things. Yes, Maharaj. And uh, so uh, now the, so the forums for writing, of course, when Prabhupada was there, he wanted devotees to write for BTG. So you have also, you were also an editor for BTG for many years. Somehow there is a, uh, no, BTG doesn't have a huge circulation and that's that there's not so much uh, you could say a visible sense of success associated with writing for BTG uh, in the devotee community. When I wrote my first article for BTG, I was elated because not just because it is a publish, but also because there was a serious editorial review process and the article actually got improved. I learned about writing, but the two things, one is to get published in VTG requires a lot of effort because of the quite a serious editorial review process. On the other hand, after going through all that effort, there is not much uh, appreciation or utilization of that resource. So how everybody needs some kind of encouragement, some kind of, you could say, a uh, sense of satisfaction that I made a worthwhile contribution and say, if, the, if a devotee spends that same time distributing books or doing some other service, that is quite often appreciated more in the community. So how do devotees... What are well, it's, not just, it's not just appreciation. Um, when Prabhupada was distributing his Bhagavatams, there wasn't so much appreciation. His Back to Godhead, he was distributing 
and it wasn't, uh, you know, it didn't make a big splash in the world, but he, he did it. Um, mm. Even about speaking, he said, if no one comes, we'll speak to the four walls. So it's not just for getting the, uh, you know, the happiness of, of being published and, and having people see our article. Um, from one point of view, if we're beginning writers, good that it's published in a small place so that not so many people see our, uh, our uh, shortcomings. You know, start in a small publication and, and build up. There's that argument to be made. But the real thing is, um, we don't care, or we're not dependent on that. Naturally, we care. But it may be big, it may be small, but let me do something. Uh, and your Indian BGG has a wider circulation. So yeah. the particularly uh, devotees in India can contribute to the Indian magazine and be more widely circulated. Yes, Maharaj. Now, you were the pioneer for having BTG published in English again, but in India separately. What was your vision for that? Uh, well, that Prabhupada wanted it and it wasn't being done. There was a the magazine at that time was being published in India. It was uh, very erratic. It was hardly, there was no schedule. It was kind of a rag. The, the, the quality of the publication was, uh, you know, the paper and the layout and everything was, was uh, unprofessional, to say the least. The translation that was being done in, in, for the Hindi edition was uh, quite poor. Like, they translated one of my articles where I talked about um, s South, South America, and it was translated... Uh, America K Duction. Oh, my God. Okay. So um, it lead, left a lot to be desired. Uh, so we thought that um, we should do something more uh, that would bring greater credit to, to the movement and to, to, to the BBT. Yes, much. Yeah, but that's a different languages is one thing, but we have now English BTG in international and English BTG in India. So you felt that it would be more accessible to Indians if it is published in India or more opportunity for Indian writers or what was the... There was no program for, for distributing the, the American BTG in India and it was cost prohibitive, if I recall. Uh, yeah. Let me think about that, was it? Yeah, it was cost prohibitive. Okay. Um, yeah, that's true. The magazine was already quite a glossy and expensive publication, and then to import it, um, the logistics would have been prohibitive, and the cost would have been prohibitive. It made much more sense to print the same magazine in India, so that's what we did. Mm. All right. I've seen for many Indian right devotees, BTG India becomes a more accessible step for writing. Yeah, and I, I should say, by the way, it wasn't that I did that. It was uh, Yudhisthir Prabhu uh, working with me, the two of us. Uh, you know, we spent months spinning the numbers and looking at different alternative ways to do things and uh, making plans. So um, on my own, I wouldn't have been able to do anything, but it was uh, a team, teamwork between Yudhisthir Prabhu and I and me. Yes. Yeah, Yudhishthir Pro was, he's also very inspired. Even now he's constantly coming up with plans about how to move it forward. Yeah. I think you talked with His Holiness Radhanath Maharaj and Radhanath Maharaj asked Yudhishthir Prabhu, was it? Yes, like that? that's right. I, I told Maharaj that I, I needed someone. I was looking for someone. He said, I've got the man for you. Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. And actually there is... And if I consider when I started writing in 2003, now in 2020, we have a lot more writers. Many devotees have started writing. And many write on their own blogs. Some submit to BTG. So broadly, uh, now discussing with the forums, you know, BTG was very, at least from what I've heard, BTG was very vibrant and very uh, widely why appreciated as well as distributed within the devotee community and by the devotee community. Somehow that is uh, not happening now. 
was there any historical reason for that well um in the in the beginning back to godhead was basically all we had um we hardly had any there were really no books um so back to godhead was the only show in town oh, that was okay. that was a big thing then once books started being published Prabhupada emphasized book distribution um so devotees became more enthusiastic about big books um, and BTG became uh, less important for them. So that was, was part of it. Uh, there, there were other reasons also. I think the editorial content at various times was not particularly stimulating. Um, and now, of course, it's a whole different game because you have the internet, which has changed the entire publishing um, landscape. So it yes. um, needs to be revis revisited and, and uh, back to God, it needs to be revisited. And we have to ask ourselves uh, what we want to do now, or so yeah. it seems to me. Although there has been some uh, talking for several years that uh, e-publishing will kill the physical publishing of books, but still it is going on. Although e-publishing is also increasing, but books are also being printed. Magazines books are also are being printed. Books haven't been adversely affected by um, the internet, but um, periodicals is a different story. Oh, okay. Periodicals have been um, challenged by the, by the internet. Some of them have, have folded. Uh, big, important magazines like Newsweek have, have just folded. Others have changed their frequency. Others have done other things but the internet represents a serious challenge to periodicals. So is it because- uh, and, and some, have, some have gone onto the internet and, and become uh, either hybrid publications, internet cum print, or, or some have gone entirely online. So there, there are different kinds of options. Yeah. So is it because uh, books have a more enduring value so people would like to keep books and physical copy in the libraries and periodicals don't have that much value? Well, periodical is something that you get periodically. A book yeah. is something basically you, you read it and, and you've read it and maybe you keep it to refer to. So um, a, a book is not really challenged by the internet, but suppose you're, for example, a news magazine. By the time you get your magazine, the news is, uh, is old because mm. you, you got you got the same news every day or, you know, every updated every, every hour or something. So why do I need a print publication to bring me that news? Um, for example, um, or anything periodical period. The idea of a periodical is that it periodically, um, uh, communicates with you. There's a back and forth between, the, there's a there's a relationship with the reader that where there's an event periodically, but if you have the internet, then you can speed up that sequence, you can change the economics of it, you can make it becomes it can be multimedia, um, so the mm. things things are, are different. Um, that's not to say that there are aren't some magazines that that will work in print. But there, there's a, a significant environmental difference now because of the inter internet. Yeah. So although the content of BTG is not really anything periodical, it is, it is perennial, but still the, the dynamics of periodicals will apply because simply because it's in that format. Well, that and I don't know that Back to Godhead is meant to be just perennial content or whether it should be relevant to things that are happening in the world. Um, you know, there's a coronavirus going on at the moment. Do we just present perennial content or do we have something to say about the coronavirus? Um, mm. The Vedic Observer was a column that was quite uh, dealing with current issues. Uh, so that is, uh, somehow it's not there. Was it earlier uh, every month, every issue is a fixed column because now it has become more erratic? Sometimes there, sometimes not there. When I was editor, it was regular. Okay. And you had fixed writers or 
that was no we we uh we we had a you know writers that we reached out to and writers who regularly contributed but it wasn't assigned that these are the writers for that page and it belongs to them you used to get adequate contributions always for the vedic observer because that was the challenge now i discussed with nagaraj prabhu and he said i'll be happy to have it but we don't get enough articles well um i don't want to stick my nose in yeah but at that, that time you used to get at that time you used to get enough articles yes okay i uh, with difficulty it wasn't always easy getting articles and some of them were better than others but um you know we went went prospecting for them and we managed to mm. have something every issue yes ma'am i think so i think we did yeah so now this uh, vedic observer jandra i was very attracted to that and i also talk with other devotees about it who are also like to write in this genre now with respect, at least with respect to btg currently i wrote an article on the corona virus but they said the earliest we can publish it will be in jan feb issue of next year so that's just because of the logistics of how long it takes for the issue to get published and was it like that at your time also it normally you would plan 8 to 10 months in advance uh, well, not 8 to 10 months but there there is a a time lag if you're a, a monthly magazine then um you there there are um there's a lag cuz it takes so, so much time to this much time to review the article this much time to edit it this much time to design it and fit it into the magazine um and it depends on your resources if you're more resourceful you, you can speed up that process if you're less resourceful um you can't mm. that takes time to print and it takes time to mail it so um just printing and mailing takes up uh, a fair amount of time so tuesday's news uh won't, won't appear in thursday's um monthly yeah. magazine so you, so that is that is a challenge and that's another reason why the internet again is um mm. so significant you can write it on tuesday and publish it tuesday night um so these are some of the the considerations otherwise you have to project a little bit you know that for example there's going to be a a, a general election in so in, in x number of months so you don't wait for the election day to write the article you you work backwards and you um project that if i write it now it can be published at such and such date um or if you're like a horticulture magazine you know that i have to plant these flowers now so that i can write the article about it and it can be published in such and such month when those you know when it, yeah. when it will be relevant yes maharaj now with respect to the uh vedic observer kind of articles to some extent our philosophy if the mainstream intellectual discourse is not so i mean there's a lot of distance between our philosophy and the mainstream intellectual discourse the, I, when this corona virus came up uh, this issue crisis i saw an article in new york times it was titled the moral meaning of the plague and it was it was one of the more introspective articles it talked about how we need to become more compassionate and look for a deeper meaning in life and learn to become more sensitive to the environment now i took that as my cue and i wrote an article and i was now of course spirituality as it is appealing to the mainstream ethos is quite non specific in the sense that we don't talk anything about like a specific soul or a specific divinity it's more of uh, a generic uh, not that's up to you. sorry that's not a rule of the game that's up to you yeah no but the way spirituality is presented in the mainstream media that's so, that's what they do because that's what they do yes yeah so now if we want to so then i wrote this article and of course it's going to get published in btg but i was checking whether so i mentioned something about the spiritual essence within us about the soul and then how 
we could become channels of compassion for for the divine and just because of those references i sent it to times of india and several other papers and they did write a lot of things on coronavirus but i find that the more if we try to bring our philosophy it's almost as if the mainstream outlets that we become disqualified for them but and if we yeah. just give if we just give more of goodness wisdom then are we really giving giving means are we really representing our tradition so yeah. that becomes a tension when you submit to particular publications you, then you want to know what their editorial policy is how how much latitude you have and and all of that um and then you look for how you can say as much as you can within that if you consider them it worthwhile also you may say well they're so narrow i don't even want to write for them uh they they won't let me say anything or but if you go the other way and say all right that it's worth it um then you say all right how do i say as much as i can within the uh parameters so so you are okay also if as as devotees we write something which is not really having much of krishna conscious content in it but i'm not very enthusiastic about it um cuz everybody everybody in his uncle can write about the need to be more compassionate the need to uh be ch- charitable to our neighbors the need to be thoughtful and introspective everybody can write about that um there's no need for us um we have something more more to say so if you can say more that's that's better otherwise maybe it's part of a strategy you know you write something generic and your name becomes a little known and then in other places you can publish and you can say more you know that's a tactical sort of a, a question but personally i would feel that if if i don't go beyond just moral platitudes and accepted wisdom i'd feel i wasn't contributing anything if that's all i did yeah i also feel the same way and now nowadays there is a genre of writing where we use the epics for for drawing human lessons now so for example 10 lessons from the ramayana and these are not necessarily devotional lessons they are more like self improvement lessons or management lessons so basically spirituality when it is presented as in the genre of how does it add value to my life in my terms then there is a lot of forum for that but when we try to present so it's more of pragmatic spirituality rather than philosophical spirituality and our presentation of spirituality is quite philosophical so it is a challenge how we can get into the mainstream uh, mainstream publishing either it's newspapers or other or books or whatever so any of course it's easier for you in india because you bhagavad gita is not exactly a uh, a foreign you know it's a, it's it's a central text bhagavad gita mahabharat ramayan um these are are not marginal texts by any means yes so you have have an advantage and you have a public that's more receptive to um something that's traditionally you know that their that their parents and grandparents uh new and and perhaps even taught them so it's not that you, even despite all the advancement technologically and uh you know the social changes in india and all of that still uh, when you talk about krishna when you talk about ram people are uh mindful that all right this is something of of substance from my culture um at least that much and and, and some people will think that this is uh uh divine uh, divine subject matter i should hear more of this so you have a, a piety in india despite everything which uh, gives you an advantage and and greater greater scope uh in india um but then again you know there are audiences that are very closed to to that sort of thing uh, to to a direct message my general sense is that we have a message to broadcast and we should broadcast it and that's why we have our own publications uh that's why we go places and 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 speak 
what it is that we have to say. Uh, the mm, that's what Prabhupada did. He, you know, not everybody. You know, more people would have been receptive if he'd been writing uh, mundane nonsense. Uh, but Prabhupada was writing to, uh, on a higher level for a, a, a more fortunate audience, and they might take it or not take it. Prabhupada said sometimes, um, "A little bit of a pure thing is better than heaps of adulterated things." And he gave the mm -hmm. example of one. Sweet Walla in Kolkata, who um, was famous, their sweets were all made in ghee. And it's more expensive. Uh, but if you want the, the, the best quality sweets, that's where you go. And therefore, they had a reputation and a, and a big clientele. You know, there'd be a line, a queue going all the way around the corner uh, because mm -hmm. they were giving the real thing. Uh, so other people, you know, they're they're happy. They get uh, sweets cooked in dalda, and it's cheap, so they're 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 satisfied. But if you want sweets cooked in ghee, you go there. So that's our business. We're not the, the market uh, commodity. We have something of greater value, and if if you want that greater value thing, then this is the place. Yeah. Prabhupada said, a little bit of a pure thing is worth heaps of adulterated things. And there are those who, are, who will be attracted to that, who are tired of the platitudes, part, tired of hearing that we should be more compassionate, we should be more self-motivated, we should be more positive in our outlook. They're sick of all that. They want to hear something substantial. And if we don't say it, then what's the use of us? In the Bible, Jesus told his followers, you are the salt of the earth. Hmm. If the salt loses its taste, then what use is it? So basically he was saying, you know, go out there and, and tell it like it is. Um, another time he said that um, don't hide your candle under a basket. Hmm. So we saw that that's what Prabhupada did. He just came out and said it. And he gave the example one time that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to Varanasi and he said that, uh, actually the story was that very early, 1967, 68, the, the, there was a World's Fair in Montreal, Canada. And so the devotees there asked Jadurani if she could send some paintings for a, a presentation there. And uh, Prabhupada was there in New York, and she asked Prabhupada, what painting should I uh, send? And at that time, she was working on a pa painting of Varahadev. said, you can send that one. She said, Swamiji, I don't think they'll understand Lord Bohr. Prabhupada said they may understand or not understand. He said, you can send it. Then he gave the example that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to Varanasi, and he said, that I have these very valuable fruits and I'm prepared to distribute them at a very cheap cost. And if no one uh, buys them, then I'll take them back. He said, but everybody bought them. Mm. Okay. That means to some extent, now the reach of our, out, of our writing will also depend on the reach of our movement. Because if we are depending primarily on our own forums for reaching out to people, because it's our message, then if it's, if ISKCON is big, then BTG reach also becomes big. If ISKCON is not that big, then BTG reach also becomes small. And also the other way, the, 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 the strength of your writing also represents an opportunity to extend the reach of your movement. If you have something that people uh, you know, get find enlightening or get excited about, then you can extend the reach of your movement with your writing. Yeah. So, going but back yes, to the you know, we're, we're the, uh, the mundaners will not be so enthusiastic to distribute our message. They're, they're in profit calculation. How much money will 
will it bring in through advertising or what other way? They're they're business they're businessmen. So if your writing fits in with their business, okay. Otherwise not. Um, whereas on our own, business is not the, the consideration. We have a message to spread, so that gives us certainly greater uh, scope for saying what we want. Uh, and then we have I mean, we have a workforce, a, a distribution force that most publishers would envy. You know how many publishers have armies of people who go out every day um, mm. um, begging people to to read their literature. So uh, it's uh, yeah, really they they can be all they have to wait for somebody to wander into a bookstore and look through all the shelves and see their book and think, well, I guess I could look like an interesting book and all of that. Um, they would love to have what we have. Armies of people who say, take this book. So we should just use our strength and not be mm, sorry that we're not something else. Um, not to say that we shouldn't be in the bookstores and be in other uh, channels, other venues, but we have an, an amazing, uh, amazingly powerful machine for distributing literature uh, in India, particularly. So yeah. we should be happy about that and, and use it to the fullest. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, during Prabhupada's times, did the issue ever come up whether BBT would publish other authors' books or not? Because right now, BBT is quite ambivalent it's about that. It published other authors' books. It published Satsrup Maharaj's Readings in Vedic Literature. It published Srup Dhamanar Maharaj's Krishna, the Supreme Scientist, at Prabhupada's request. So um, the question did come up. The question was asked and answered. Oh. But now there seems to be some reservation for that. Uh, that's... I can't say anything about it. It's up to uh, that. Maybe how um, how things are are going on. I don't really know. But in terms of Prabhupada's direction, he wanted his disciples to write, and he wanted BBT to publish writings by others. He criticized uh, our um, parent institution, from which. Uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur's institution, that uh, he, he saw their book table and it was like nothing since 1943, you know, uh, nothing new. Uh, but, you know, it's as if time had stopped uh, when uh, their Guru Maharaj disappeared. So Prabhupada didn't, he, he criticized that. Oh, okay. Uh, so it shouldn't be frozen, Prabhupada leaves and, and then that's the end of the world. Um, there, there's plenty of opportunity for um, new literature. The Goswamis wrote so many books, and then followers of the Goswamis wrote so many books. And then their followers wrote so many books. That's not meant to stop. Yeah. And for the BBT to publish writings by um, devotees is perfectly legitimate. But Prabhupada didn't want to pay. He, he was against royalties and all of that. He wanted the books published, written and published as devotional service, not as business. Okay. That's true. Um, now, devotees say we have, in India, some full-time devotees. Uh, but in the rest of ISKCON, we don't have that many temple resident or full-time devotees. And then we have devotees who are grahasthas. So now for full-time devotees, it's possible, but often there are a lot of other institutional services which come up that doesn't leave a lot of time for writing. For grahasthas to actually earn a living through writing, writing exclusively in bhakti, I have I, I not seen many people who have been able to do that. So it, it's usually going to become like writing is going to be one additional service that you do apart from... That's good. Just like Kirtan, it's not meant to be a means of, of earning a livelihood. 
Okay. People do it. They earn their livelihood. They support their families by kirtan, by Bhagavad Gita. But Prabhupada criticizes that. That kirtan, Bhagavad Gita should be done for the glorification of Krishna, not for, uh, as he said, filling the belly. So if, if the writers write for the sake of glorifying Krishna and they make their money elsewhere, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, especially in a country like India, where there's a lot of competition, you know, it, writing itself is time intensive, earning a livelihood also is not that easy. It also requires a lot of time. So then... So many things require a lot of time. But people find time for the things that they want to do or that they find meaningful. It's not that there's no time. It's that the time is spent in other pursuits. Hmm. There's a, a Roman writer, Seneca, he said... Um, Life is amply long for one who orders it properly. Oh, okay. That's that's nice. Now, just uh, so with respect to forums for publishing, now now genres of writing. Uh, when you talk about the Vedic observer, to some extent, if you have to write about certain issues, then we need to know about those issues. I was just recently discussing about this Vedic Observer column with one devotee and he was telling about how there was a, uh, there was a uh, review of a movie in BTG and the author in that review itself said that uh, I have not watched this movie and as devotees you don't watch, the, watch movies and then they wrote the review. So now that is itself a, for most readers it is a credibility destroyer. Is you yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, how much should a, a devotee s study or stay in touch with uh, current affairs or current events in the world so that we can comment in a balanced way toward it? On it. My general view would be not much. Otherwise, you start. You already said people don't have much time, and if they start spending their time in the newspapers and the, uh, you know researching this and researching that, uh, or just staying in touch with what's going on in the world, uh, their time will be still less, plus it'll be polluted by all mundane topics. So I don't generally recommend that. Um, I also wouldn't recommend pretending to know about something you don't know anything about. That's not wise either. Uh, but there are other ways of writing. Um, sometimes you may look into a topic. You say this topic is something we really want to say something about and you do your research and you 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 get into it because you you think here's an opportunity to where i can really say something and i to say that i need to know something about it something particular but just a, a sort of a general uh open the floodgates and let the news pour in to my mind my mind is already suffering enough it's already polluted enough um that won't help me but um, there are other ways of, of writing, um, even about um, present things. You don't have to write about um, the statistics of the coronavirus or something. You could write about the impact that it had on, on your neighbor, uh, some personal story, some experience that, that you had. Um, it doesn't have to be that you, you read the newspapers thoroughly and you know all the ins and outs of coronavirus policy and how the virus works and all of that kind of stuff. Um, there are other, other ways to do it. And there are journalists who've been ex exceedingly successful in just that way. They don't write about um, things they don't know about. They, they write from their experience. Um, and that, that can be very rich. Uh, also, devotees have their own personal areas of knowledge. You're a doctor, you're an engineer, you're a lawyer, you're a this, you're a that. Um, you're already expert. So write from your expertise. Not that you have to be um, a general news um, hound or a general news consumer. Uh, there's a, a writer, what's his name? Uh, Atul Gawande, who's a, a surgeon, an Indian surgeon in America and who's done very, very well. He's written 
uh, very engaging books, all, all just about his, what he finds in his profession. Yeah, he's written uh, books on cancer and other subjects, quite good. Quite, um, yeah, materially, uh, you know, the metaphysical content is another thing, but he, he writes well and he writes from his experience. Um, it's not that he goes looking through the newspapers to see what might be an interesting topic to write about. He, he, he's already in an interesting world. There's so much to write about in his profession. But it's not that you have to be a doctor. You could be uh, doing embroidery, you know. <laughs> you know, a, a, a grandmother doing embroidery. And there's a whole culture around that. And there's a whole, you know, all sorts of things that you can say about that. Uh, it's not that it ha you have to be a, a neurosurgeon or a nuclear scientist or uh, uh, you know, something uh, sexy. Uh, so many ordinary things are, are interesting. If you're a monk, you've got a, a completely fascinating world. You've got a completely fascinating world, totally different from what everybody else is doing. Uh, what is going on there? You know, write about that. How the world? How does the world look to a monk? How does the world look look to a, to a brahmachari, to a uh, you know a, a person who's aspiring to make spiritual progress in Kali Yuga in Bombay? That's a whole, you know. There's, there's a, a British writer who's made a, more than one. There, there are people who write from their travel experiences. Um, and it doesn't have to be the Himalayas and, uh, you know, all of that. They, they go to, interest, to places where they find something interesting. It might be an out-of-the-way, ordinary kind of place. It might be a village. Uh, there's so much that you can write about. Um, just have to keep your eyes open and, and your... Uh, be thinking about it. Uh, there's so much that, that happens. Sometimes you may go to some place where you think something interesting is going to happen. You attend a meeting, you, you uh, attend a conference, you see what kind of nonsense there's, they're speaking there, and you write about that. Um, the writer Tom Wolfe, who's a celebrated American writer, got sort of his... his Prominent public career got launched when he went to a to a uh, an exhibition of uh, cars, uh, hot you know sort of souped up hot rod uh, zoom zoom cars, and he he wrote an article about that that be, that went as we would say now it it, it went viral you know it, it came to prominence and it started him on a, a, a huge career, um, you know no research in the uh, looking through newspapers and stuff like that. That's also, by the way, secondhand news. It's nothing you really know about. All you know about is what people said about it. Um, Firsthand news is so much more interesting. Something from your personal experience, something from your, uh, from your own life. Uh, just to give an example, um, our uh, Rasaraj Prabhu wrote an article for BTG many, many years ago. Not a science article, although he's a scientist. He wrote an article about um, the uh, a procession of, of the deity in his in the South Indian town that he uh, was that he grew up in, and his mother bringing out offerings. And you know, it was a wonderful article because yeah, it was all from his his personal experience. So you don't need to read you know, to immerse yourself in, in the news or in mundane topics. And doing that has, you know, can be uh, bad for your health. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, and bad for your writing also, especially since there's a lot of bad writing out there. You start writing the way everybody else writes in uh, certain types of publications, and it's not really the best writing. It's, you know, something less than, less than great. You say in general, in the, in the news world, the writing yeah. is not that good. 
It, it may or may not be. Sometimes it's very good, depending on the, on the, the publication and, and the individual writer. But you know, you may not learn that. It's not like the greatest greatest writers in history uh, have been writing for the are, are writing today for the Times of India. There's there's better people. Uh, you know, even if we're interested in you know mundane writing, that there's there's people who uh, are amazing. That's just materially speaking, um, the mm -hmm. newspapers. So that's that's a you know sort of a small concern. But the main thing is it's Gramya Kata, and then your mind starts is is filled with these topics of this interesting thing and that interesting thing, this weird thing, this uh, thing for me to think about, and we forget Krishna. So, so what's the use? But when there's something, again, there's some particular topic, you research that, you, you make something of it, that's different. But just to consume the newspaper every day, and it's part of my service, you know, why are you reading the newspaper an hour and a half? Well, it's, it's part of my service, Prabhu. That's, that becomes Maya. Okay. Yeah, when I was, I used to write quite a few articles for Vedic Observer earlier. Some of my books are also compilations of those articles. But I find that you require a lot of study of the contemporary subjects. And then there is not much spirituality that we can actually bring in. And what the spirituality we bring in is often quite predictable. That yeah. you're, not, you're not the body or the soul and rise to this, you're the bodily conception. So then it becomes somewhat stereotypical also. Yeah. When you write from your personal experience, it's a That's whole different story. And people are interested in people. Mm. Um, I'm Inc. started a magazine, People Magazine, because they found out that people are interested in people. Uh, some of the, the best writers, that they just write about uh, people, the interesting people they've met, which doesn't have to be a celebrity. It can just be a, you know, a person who's interesting for one reason or another, or, or, or an encounter that was interesting for one reason or another. Um, As devotees, we are not written much in this genre, isn't it, Maharaj? The personal, through personal experience. We well, don't have. I I don't know, but but we can be. Yeah. I like this point about secondhand news and first-hand news. Yeah, after all, most of the comments we will issues will comment on. People have already read about them. We're just giving some new perspective, but first-hand news, yes. And in sometimes you sometimes you can just take sort of the cream off the top. Um, you don't need to know the details. You don't need to know all the ins and outs of something. All you need to know is just enough to provide you a launch pad, essentially, for the topic you want to talk about. Prabhupada did that. You know, he he talked about matter and antimatter. And uh, you know, dealt with the article for about a paragraph and a half, and then he was off and running on Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. Mm. So, uh, you know, that's another approach. And again, you want to do it in such a way that it doesn't seem um, disconnected or, or artificial. There's an art to it, but uh, that's you know, another, there are different ways to do things. That's another way. Even that's part of your personal experience, you know, the, the, that we're surrounded by the news right now. Um, I find that the easiest way to get most of the news is just uh, wait for people to tell you because everyone else is talking about the news. So you'll get it that way. Somebody says, what do you think about X? You say, I don't know. What, it, what is X? I hadn't heard about it. They tell you what X is and now you're filled in. Um, instead of, you know, an hour to, to read the newspaper and look for something. Um, and you don't even know necessarily what it is. All you know is what they think it is. And that itself can be the topic. I okay. met this person who was scared to death of. Okay. Yes. So... In genres of writing, this brings you experiential writing. And uh, in our tradition, how much is fiction writing been uh, 
a part and how much could devotees get into that genre of writing? Well, again, for me to talk about percentages or uh, uh, there, ha yeah. there has been fiction. Satsurup Maharaj has written some uh, fiction. He's written some fables um, for children. He's written some other fiction. Um, it's been done. I'm trying to think of other fiction. I, I don't hear, I, I've heard of people saying I'm writing, I'm going to write this, write that fiction. I haven't seen much and um, I haven't seen much fiction. Yeah. And Prabhupada yeah. mostly, I didn't see Prabhupada encourage fiction either. But if a, a writer is expert and can convey Krishna consciousness through fiction, um, that may be successful. Yes, Maharaj. Now, um, with respect to fiction, we have some like Tamal Krishna Maharaj wrote the, the story yeah, there's of the fiction. That's right. So now that is, in some ways, and I have talked with some devotees who want to get into fiction. They said they told me some about some fiction writers. So they said that if you are using fic, if you want to make an argument or you want to preach something, uh, use non-fiction. If you want to. If you're using fiction, it is meant primarily for telling a story. If you're that explicit, you know, this is like, it is almost like a conversion story. Then it seems to be too, too utilitarian. So, for, well, for example, first, Bhakt Bhaktivinoda Thakur wrote Jaiva Dharma, which is yeah. really just a framework for the philosophy. It's, 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 it's not like plot intensive by any means. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that can be done. So Now, for example, C.S. Lewis wrote the Tales of Narnia. And yes. uh, the, the, though it can be entirely read and enjoyed as just a fiction. But then mm -hmm. there is also a lot of Christian symbolism in it. And now that would require a lot of effort to write. Uh, if some devotees get into that and... Uh, so that means the book can be read at multiple levels as just ordinary entertainment or as some spiritual edification. What would your thoughts of for a devotee to write like that? First, let them become good writers. C.S. Lewis is uh, enormously capable as a writer. Um, mm. and people want to get started on fiction. Um, fiction is hard. And fiction, it, it's hard because... There's incredible fiction writers out there. Uh, the, 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 the fiction writers avail, available on the market are, some of them are terrifyingly good. Um, why should I read your fiction rather than their fiction? So if you want to get into fiction, you can. But my advice would be first learn the basics. Learn how to write good English sentences. Uh, learn how to express yourself clearly and succinctly. Uh, learn how to say something of, of substance, uh, learn the basics of the craft, and then at some point, if you want to venture into fiction, then that will be your, your choice. But not to know, how, you know how to do the basic things, but being keen to get into fiction may not be, the, it wouldn't be the path I'd recommend. Mm. So we don't, when, when we have a particular purpose for writing, so we don't necessarily have to follow the standards of pure fiction. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur has done it. So we could just use a fictional setting as a tool for conveying our message in a more interesting way also. That One is, could do that. Okay. And uh, now this may be particular to Indian setting. It, uh, we as a... Um, movement because we have attracted more people from the stem fields more engineering and medicine so uh, that is the younger generation now uh, most of them are not intrinsically good at writing and some of them are but very not many often those who go into the field of humanities in india it's called arts they are they learn more about writing and literature so for our devotees to learn writing itself takes a lot of effort so, in a sense, for... That's what I said. Some of them may just write to, and express themselves as well as they can and depend on editors to uh, refine what they've written. Yeah. That's also possible. Yes, Maharaj. 
main thing is to have something to say. If you don't have anything to say, it doesn't matter how good a writer you are. Mm. And if you have something to say, just like Prabhupada said, you know, the neighbors somehow express themselves in the time of need, even if they don't speak the language. Mm. Uh, Prabhupada, from a material point of view, his, his English is not the king's English, but he had something urgent to say. So he, he said it. And then, you know, later editors came and so on. Otherwise, Prabhupada's original Bhagavatams, you know, sometimes the type is upside down. So the grammar, Grammarly would, would have a picnic with, you know, with it, yeah. um, spelling yeah. and so many things. But Srinvanti Gayanti Grinanti Sadhava. It's perfect. Mm. So when uh, devotees write, at that time, is it that is it important for a devotee to be instructed by some senior devotee to write, or we can take Prabhupada's instructions as standing instructions for everyone, and then any any devotee can start writing? Because now, in a sense, any devotee can start their own blog, and they can start publishing. And then they can start a WhatsApp group, or they can write on their Facebook. So, is does everybody can say that they have the adhikar to write just because they are devotees? Or should we wait for? Yeah, yeah I think everybody certainly has, uh, what would you say? A, 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 uh, yeah, everyone has a, 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 you know, you have a right to speak, you have a right to write. Um, it doesn't require um, GBC authorization. But, you know, if you want to take on a serious project, then you may, uh, just as Kaviraj Goswami did for Chaitanya Charitamrita, he sought the blessings of of the, the Lord, he sought the blessings of the senior devotees. So for that sort of a serious undertaking, you, you um, this is the path chalked out by our Acharyas. They do seek um, blessings and authority. But it's not that, you know, before I can um, write anything, like before I start a blog, I have to, uh, you know, see at least the zonal secretary to uh, okay. get an organization, mm. you know, on your own enthusiasm. Um, there is that authorization from Prabhupada, we should all write, so. Yeah. And, uh, and then accept criticism also, if devotees read it and say, you know, it was good, but, and you take that on board, you see what, how you can improve. Yes. There is in writing the art and the craft. Mm -hmm. So I've seen that many devotees, especially now with the blogosphere open, anybody can just write anything. So many devotees feel that the whole process of receiving criticism and going through the laborious process of improving my writing, it's just too, it's just too tiresome. So if, like for example, I encourage devotees to write for BTG, but they feel that there's such a long editorial process and instead of and then instead of that, I just write on my my blogosphere, and so it seems that the effort there is to some extent. That's uh, also a, go ahead. A, yeah, a greater emphasis on self-expression for many devotees in writing. This is what I experience. This is how I write. You take it or leave it. Well, there's there's different fora for your personal journal. You don't need any kind of training. Just spill. Spill your heart out onto the page. Uh, for the internet, a lot of places, it really doesn't matter how expert you are. Not that it doesn't matter, but it's not the most important thing. How, whether you punctuate properly, whether you're, how good or bad your spelling is, whether your grammar's up to scratch, um, how well you express yourself. It's, um, you, the, the, you have something to say, uh, it, it, it's, it's of substance, it matters, and people get it. Um, so, and it's not, you, you know, the, the blogs and the internet, it's, or it's not, it's made of vapor anyway, you know, it, it, it comes and it goes. So um, your, your exciting blog post is history after uh, three days, it's, it's gone. So it's not that, 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 craft and, and skill and all of that are essential. They'll help, 
Um, I certainly, when I read something on the internet, if it's well written, if it's spelled right, if it's punctuated properly, if the author is, is clear and succinct, that makes an impression on me. And when he's sloppy and incoherent, uh, I may just say, forget it, uh, just on that alone. Uh, the idea is he, whatever he wants to say, I don't know what it is, and I don't think I'll ever know what it is. It's, it's hopeless. Um, so there's something to be said for those skills everywhere. But um, there's also something to be said for just, you know, you, you speak English or you speak Hindi or you speak whatever you speak and you have something to say, say it. That, that's also there. And don't wait ten you probably but himself. He didn't wait to become uh, perfect in his use of English before he wrote Srimad Bhagavatam. He had something urgent to say. He said it. So Maharaj, as an editor, I talked about this art and craft of writing. So the craft is more like the mechanical skills which can be learned and the art is maybe more one's personal expression of one's style. So in your personal writing, now, I saw that there are two distinct styles. You, when you wrote your VTG articles, VTG editorials, there is, you could say, like a delicious sting in those articles where you make points in a very sharp and uh, punchy kind of way. And then when your uh, <clears throat> book on uh, Vanity Karma, that has a, a more, that has quite a different tone. So was this something which you consciously adopted for each purpose? And how did you develop these distinct tones for writing? Well, it has to do with the subject matter at hand. Um, obviously, if you're writing about one of the world's most serious philosophical works, you're not going to be uh, breezy and offhand. Um, in in my book, though, I you know I use sarcasm. I use um, you know sort of a full range of the way I usually express myself. But but it is a serious book and it's a serious uh, subject, and I'm I'm conscious of that. Uh, other things may be uh, less grave or. Uh, that call for a different voice. You know, when you when you speak at a, when you give an announcement at a Sunday feast or you give an ordinary Bhagavatam class, that's different from when you uh, give a uh, a eulogy at a funeral. Mm. Um, as the occasion may may ask of you. Okay. So about the vanity karma. I, I like, like the whole book. I liked it, especially the in introduction where you position yourself. You know, how does a, uh, uh, you said that you're not trying to discover a uh, hidden, hidden Vaishnava within the teachings of, of the Ecclesiastes. So that particular approach that basically it was more like a Vaishnava, how a Vaishnava would read the book of the Ecclesiastes uh, was that approach something which organically came for you as you kept reading it, or that was the approach you had originally planned because there is also the autobiographical narrative over there that that was the book I read first and you say that that book of the Ecclesiastes was the book of question book that gave you questions and then the Bhagavad Gita was the book that provided you answers well I think it's it was conscious and it was um, sort of a natural approach to the book I, I did want to write a um, I didn't want to stuff our philosophy into the author's uh, throat. Um, I wanted to, to write a book that would be honest and um, that would respect the book I was commenting on. Um, okay. Yes, ma'am. Are you working on any new books now? I'm working with uh, one of my grand disciples, Anakatu Upanishad, translation and commentary. Oh, okay. Well, if, uh, for uh, devotees who are uh, eager to write, is there any concluding message or maybe something you would like to share with them? 
Prabhupada said, write your realization, what you've understood of the philosophy. Uh, write to glorify Krishna, not for some other motive, not to be a great writer, not to be uh, famous. Prabhupada said it may be published or not published, but we should try to glorify Krishna. Yes, Maharaj. So as devotees, we shouldn't worry too much about the quantification of the success of writing then. Yes. We try to do everything nicely, but our, our, our main consideration is to glorify Krishna. If you have all ornaments and, you know, uh, literary uh, embellishments and poetic expressions and so much, and there's no Krishna consciousness, then show maybe Kevalam. It's it's mm. a waste of time. It's useless. Um, Tadvad, uh, what is that? Visargo, Janatagra. Uh, uh, even Vyastav is criticized. You wrote so many things, all wonderful, but you haven't glorified Krishna. So naturally, you're dissatisfied. Uh, so now, directly glorify Krishna. Even if it's imperfectly done, the honest people will accept it. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj, for your time. Now, I, I myself learned a lot, especially the point about secondhand news and firsthand experience. That is a powerful point. And I hope that through this podcast, many devotees get inspiration and your blessings to take up the service of writing for Krishna. Thank you very much. Humble obeisance. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jaya.